Molecular Orbital Theory Introduction The goal of this podcast is to first explain why molecular orbital theory is required and when to use it. We'll then learn how to draw MO diagrams for four of the homonuclear diatomics. I hope that you'll be able to visualize the basic shapes of the orbitals so that you can also understand why some are bonding orbitals and some are antibonding orbitals. In this class, we'll talk about two ways that we model bonding. While this video is specifically about molecular orbital theory, I want to frame our entire discussion by comparing and contrasting these two models. Both valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory allow us to describe, explain, and explain bonding in molecules, and to some extent, predict what they will do. Generally, molecular orbital theory is considered to be significantly more accurate. It's also significantly more complicated, generally requiring the use of computers to calculate out energy level diagrams. And so it's very useful to have simple, a simpler model as well, which will allow us to explain bonding patterns without always using energy level calculations. So in valence bond theory, when we get there, we'll see that molecules retain their own orbitals and then form bonds by overlapping these orbitals. We'll talk a lot more about this in later videos. In MO theory, we'll be using quantum mechanics to combine atomic orbitals into new molecular orbitals that create the bonds. So what is molecular orbital theory, or MO theory for short? This is the quantum mechanical treatment of bonding. It uses combinations of the wave functions that we discussed earlier in the course to determine new orbitals, which then can create bonds. As with earlier chapters, we aren't going to do the math ourselves, but rather use the completed math to help us model what is happening. This treatment of bonding is quite good at predicting experimental results, better than what we'll see when we use valence bond theory. And yet this calculation of energy levels is quite complex and energy intensive. So while it does yield the best results, many times simpler models are used and they're accurate enough. For us to focus our learning and not create too much of a memorization burden, we'll be focusing on the second row homonuclear diatomics in terms of what you'll need to draw yourself. It's important to first remember what wave interference is, as this is how molecular orbitals are made. We can use our experience with water waves to help picture this. If two waves interact with each other, in some places, they will add together, forming constructive interference, and in other places, they will cancel out, forming destructive interference. Remember back to our earlier discussion. Electrons have properties of both waves and particles. Because of their wave-like pro properties, they have interference patterns. So let's remember how wave interference works in a bit more detail before moving on to the details of MO diagrams. We'll take two waves that I have labeled wave 1 and wave 2 because these are in directly opposite phase, if we add them together, they will completely cancel out. Keep in mind, destructive interference doesn't need to be complete. Anytime the amplitudes are lowered, it's destructive interference. Now let's look at what happens if instead we added wave one to another wave one. We'd see that since they are in the same phase, they would add to each other, making a larger wave. This is constructive interference. So now with that in mind, how does this relate to orbitals? In MO theory, we combined orbitals from each atom to make new orbitals. The shape of the wave interference determines the shape of the new orbitals. Let's look at the simplest case first. Two hydrogen atoms bonded together. When these combine, they can form two different types of orbitals. This will be a common theme throughout MO diagrams. We'll combine a certain number of orbitals to get that same number of new orbitals. However, these new orbitals are not the same energy levels as each other or the starting energy level. Remember back to our conversation about interference. They can combine in both constructive and destructive manners. The constructive interference forms the low energy orbital. We call this the bonding orbital. The destructive interference forms the high energy orbital, 
and we call this the antibonding orbital. Look at these a minute, and let's see if we can see why these are named bonding and antibonding. First, is the nuclei positive or negatively charged? We, of course, know that it's positively charged because there are protons in it. So, what holds two positively charged things together? Well, it's the negatively charged electrons. So now, look at where the electrons are situated in the bonding and the antibonding orbitals. In the bonding orbitals, the electrons are situated mostly between the nuclei, which adds to the bond. In the antibonding orbital, most of the density is outside of the two nuclei, pulling the nuclei apart and subtracting from the bond. While this is a bit of a qualitative discussion, it will hopefully help you to remember what they look like and why they are called bonding and antibonding. There's one more nomenclature item we need to talk about, and that is the sigma that you see. This describes the shape. In this video, we will only be discussing sigma, but we'll get into the pi shapes in the following video. Notice it is symmetrical around the bond. That is why it's a sigma orbital. The last part of the nomenclature to discuss is the subscript. We put a 1s here to show us the orbital that it came from. It originated from the 1s orbitals. Let's summarize that discussion with a key, few key take-home points. S orbitals combine in two ways to form sigma bonding orbitals and sigma star antibonding orbitals. We started with two atomic orbitals and we formed two molecular orbitals. When looking at where the electrons go, we will fill low to high, just as we did when filling atomic energy level diagrams. Of course, drawing these cartoon pictures every time we wanted to talk about energy levels would get a little bit unwieldy. So, just like we drew simpler energy level diagrams for atomic orbitals, we can draw them for molecular orbitals. This is what the base structure of the diagram would look like. Notice the energy level arrow off to the side. Notice the atomic orbitals that were used to make the molecular orbitals are drawn out. These are the exact same as your atomic energy level diagrams that we did a while back, earlier in the course. Though these atomic orbitals no longer exist, we still draw them so that we can see where the molecular orbitals came from. We already filled in the atomic energy level diagram electrons, since you learned how to do this in an earlier video. We can draw boxes or lines for the molecular orbitals. You'll see them drawn both ways. Be sure to notice that one of the boxes is higher and one of the boxes is lower than the starting energy levels. These represent the bonding and antibonding orbitals respectively. The lower energy level is the bonding orbital, the higher energy level is the antibonding orbital. We will always fill electrons into the orbitals from low to high, just like we did for the atomic orbitals. Let's start with hydrogen. We have two electrons, one that comes from each hydrogen. We can fill these in starting with the lowest energy level. Just like the atomic orbitals, molecular orbitals can hold two electrons. We can do the same thing for helium. Since each atom has two electrons, there is a total of four electrons. Since each orbital only holds two electrons, we put two in the bonding orbital and two in the antibonding orbital. Let's review what we did. We counted valence electrons and filled into atomic orbital diagrams along the sides. We did this earlier in the course. The new part was we, to we took the total valence electrons from each atom and we filled that into the appropriate molecular orbital diagram from low to high. 
We filled according to the Pauli exclusion Hans and Aufbau principles that we learned about for, during atomic energy level diagrams. I left the hydrogen and helium energy level diagrams up so that we can be reminded about what we've already done, but we're going to now do the exact same thing for lithium and beryllium. Now we'll have more electrons though. For lithium, we now can do the exact same thing for both the 1s and the 2s orbitals. Notice the 2s orbitals are situated above the 1s orbitals because they're higher in energy. We now have three electrons from each atom, which gives us six total. And so we'll fill in from low to high until we've used up our six electrons. We can do the same thing for beryllium, though now we'll have eight electrons. So we'll fill in from low to high until we've used up all of our electrons. Often for MO diagrams, you'll only see the valence electrons drawn. So for lithium and beryllium, they might only show the N equals two level drawn. This is okay, and you can do it either way. Now let's talk about something called bond order. This is very similar to the idea of single and double bonds that we'll discuss in valence bond theory that you might be familiar with from other classes. However, MO diagrams offer a bit more flexibility in how these are written. We generally think about a single bond having two electrons, and each electron is worth half of a bond. MO theory also lets us easily do decimal point bond orders. The formula for bond order is one half of the times the bonding electrons minus the antibonding salt binding electrons. So you'll add up all of the electrons in bonding orbitals, you'll subtract the number of electrons in antibonding orbitals, and then you'll divide by two. Roughly, if you have a bond order of one that corresponds to a single bond, a bond order of two, a double bond, and a bond order of three, a triple bond. Let's find the bond order for each of the following MO diagrams. We've already drawn the MO diagrams, and so we can work from there. If you're asked to find the bond order, you're generally going to need to draw out the MO diagram in order to get this. We can look at hydrogen and see that we have two electrons in the bonding orbitals and none in the antibonding orbitals. So we'll have two minus zero divided by two equals one. For helium, we can see that we have two in the bonding, two in the antibonding, and so we'll have two minus two divided by two equals zero. For lithium, we can see that we have two, four in bonding orbitals and two in antibonding orbitals. So we'll have four minus two times by one half. And that equals one. For beryllium, we'll have four in the bonding and four in the antibonding, which gives us four minus four divided by two equals zero. In summary, we now know how to use MO theory and that it has a higher predictive value than valence bond theory. We'll often choose to use valence bond theory once we've learned it, when possible due to its simplicity. We've shown you how to draw MO diagrams for first and second row homonuclear diatomics that are in the S block. And in the next video, we'll learn how to do it for the P block.